Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining us today for this important webinar. The Monkeypox Dialogues, Current State and Future Public Health Strategies. This webinar will provide an opportunity to assess where we are regarding human monkeypox, HMPXV, for those most impacted by the virus and the organizations that serve them. Globally, there are nearly 81,000 confirmed cases reported and nearly 30,000 cases reported in the United States. Currently, there are 759 confirmed cases in New Jersey. And while cases have been declining in our state, it's important to note that the disease is still circulating and in some cases may cause severe illness and death. This webinar will cover where we are with infection rates as well as available resources. We will also discuss lessons learned. One key factor in the state's response to monkeypox was our ability to take what we learned in our COVID-19 response and be able to respond quickly to work with community partners and local health departments to get vaccines out quickly. We will also discuss how to prepare for future outbreaks of monkeypox, as well as other diseases. I now want to turn the discussion over to Greta Anschutz, Acting Assistant Commissioner for the Department's Division of HIV, STD, and TB Services, who will introduce the panelists and moderate today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I appreciate those kind words and introduction. Um, as the Commissioner said, my name is Greta Anschutz and I will be moderating today. It is my pleasure to uh, introduce to you our three dedicated New Jersey Department of Health colleagues who are here to share their expertise. First, we have Dr. Meredith Hodak Avalos, who is a senior public health physician working on infectious diseases. Rebecca Warble from the Office of Disaster Resilience, who is really critical to ensuring the distribution of necessary supplies like vaccines when we have new public health issues arise. And finally, Dr. Gabriel Moore, who manages community grants and advocates for community engagement and partnerships. I wanted to let everybody know we hope to share with you the uh, dis infection rates and the current state resources talk about some of the lessons we've learned and discuss how we can prepare for future potential outbreaks of monkeypox and other diseases. Just a few housekeeping notes, all attendees will be muted during presentations. Please feel free if you have a question to use the Q&A function located within Zoom. And know that we will be reserving about 10 to 15 minutes after the presentations to answer questions and have a discussion. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Meredith Hodak Avalos in order to start us off. Thank you very much, Greta. So good afternoon. My name is Meredith Hodak Avalos, and I will be going over the current trends in monkeypox in New Jersey. Um, maybe next slide. Thank you. Um, including case numbers and who has been most affected. I will also present a brief review of, of the symptoms, ways to prevent monkeypox and treatment. Next slide. So what is monkeypox? So monkeypox is a disease caused by the monkeypox virus, which is in the same family of viruses as smallpox. Symptoms are similar to smallpox symptoms, but much milder. Monkeypox is a zoonotic disease, meaning that it can be spread from animals to people. And it's not a new virus. The first case, uh, human case of monkeypox uh, was recorded in 1970. However, prior to 2022, the current outbreak, uh, monkeypox had mostly been reported in people in several regions of Africa. Cases outside of these Countries were rare and linked to travel or imported animals. Beginning in May of 2022, the current outbreak of monkeypox has impacted many countries that do not normally report monkeypox and is spreading through close contact from person to person. Next slide. All states in the US and Puerto Rico have had cases of monkeypox and New Jersey currently has the eighth highest number of cases in the United States. There are the current numbers as of November 16th that have been reported. Next slide. Thank you. In New Jersey, all but two counties have been affected thus far. And as you can see from this slide, most cases have been in the northeastern portion of the state. 
the case count as of actually this is as of November 23rd um, as well we have 759 cases identified in New Jersey next slide. In the US, new cases of monkeypox have continued to decline, though there are, as the commissioner noted, there's still new cases being reported. So it's important to, to be aware that it's still ongoing. Next slide. And as in the rest of the United States, in New Jersey, new cases of monkeypox were at their highest level in July and August and have since thankfully been on a downtrend. However, there is continuing to be uh, ongoing low level circulation of the virus and uh, unfortunately severe cases, although rare, have still been reported. Therefore, it continues to be important for people at higher risk of monkeypox to take steps to protect themselves. Next slide, please. So the, as you can see from this slide, the majority of cases of monkeypox in New Jersey have occurred in males between 18 to 49 years old. And among those cases for whom race and ethnicity data have been reported, 64% of cases have occurred in individuals who are Black or Hispanic. Next slide. And also, as in the rest of the United States, New Jersey has thus far mostly experienced spread within a defined subpopulation, gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. According to our data that we have, which is not complete, but as what has been reported by people, um, is 87.3% of cases where sexual orientation is known identified themselves as LGB, LGBTQ+. For those cases with available data, only 31% have reported a known exposure to a person with monkeypox. However, it's important to note that others may have engaged in activities where they could have been at higher risk of being exposed to monkeypox through close contact with someone they did not know was sick at the time such as having multiple or anonymous sexual partners or attending events where close skin to skin contact could occur. So an important point here though, is that while we continue to see spread of monkeypox mainly impacting the MSM community, it is important to know that anyone can get monkeypox regardless of sex, gender, sexual orientation or race ethnicity, if they have the kind of close contact with someone who has a disease that we know can lead to spread. Next slide, please. So just a quick review of the signs and symptoms of monkeypox. These can include systemic symptoms like fever, headache, muscle aches, and exhaustion, as well as the characteristic rash. People with monkeypox may get the non-rash symptoms a couple of days before rash, or the rash may be the first sign noticed. And it's important to note that the rash can be subtle at first. It, can, may, look, it may look like a bug bite. Um, it could be itchy or painful. And other symptoms may be noted as well in, first, such as pain with swallowing, pain with urination, or pain or bleeding when emptying the bowels. The rash can affect the eyes and rarely may cause inflammation in the heart muscle or the brain. Current testing methods for monkeypox uh, continue to require a rash to be present. Next slide. Next slide, oh, thank you. So knowledge about the way that monkeypox is being spread during this outbreak is still evolving, but our current understanding continues to be that the main way that people are likely to get infected is via contact with lesions on the skin, mouth, throat, anus, or rectum during sexual activity or other very close contact with a person who is sick with monkeypox. There have been a few cases, not in New Jersey necessarily, but nationally and in other, or internationally in this outbreak linked to exposures with contaminated sharps in healthcare or piercing tattoo uh, situations. We know that it can be spread from the time of start of any symptoms until the rash is fully healed. Whether it can be spread prior to symptoms or after symptoms have resolved, as well as the risk of spread through respiratory secretions and other body fluids are areas that continue to be researched. Therefore, we continue to recommend the following measures to protect against getting monkeypox. People should avoid close skin to skin contact with anyone who is sick with monkeypox symptoms or who has a rash that looks like monkeypox. They should avoid objects and materials that a person with monkeypox has used that have not been properly disinfected. And it is recommended for, uh, as is recommended for prevention of many contagious diseases, washing hands often, especially before eating or touching your face and after using the restrooms, always key. It should be noted that the risk of getting monkeypox through contaminated objects is considered to be lower than from direct contact with rash or other infected um, body parts. Um, and last, uh, but not least, because as we showed on the previous slide, people have gotten monkeypox without reporting known contact with the case. It is important for those who are at risk of exposure to monkeypox to get vaccinated. This includes the close contacts of known cases of monkeypox, as well as very importantly, people who are at risk of coming into close contact in the future. So we'll talk in more detail about this, the details of who's indicated for vaccination a little bit later. 
um, but I just wanted to, to highlight that here. It's very important. So, uh, and preliminary information on the vaccine's effectiveness in this outbreak have shown promising results. It is important to note, however, since we are still studying the total effectiveness of the vaccine, that we still encourage people to continue to protect themselves from infection by using the other tactics that are noted here as well. Next slide. So finally, if someone does get sick with monkeypox, there are a number of things they can do to prevent spreading the rash to other parts of the body, especially the eyes, very important, as well as to prevent spreading the disease to others. The CDC has detailed information on various things that people uh, will need to know if they're sick, but key points include you know, taking care of yourself, keeping the rash covered, avoid touching it, washing your hands, sanitizing your hands, um, and isolating at home as long as there are symptoms. And if somebody with monkeypox does need to go out before the rash is fully healed, it's really important that they take all available measures to prevent spreading it to others. That includes wearing a mask, completely covering all rash, and cleaning a shared surfaces with a recommended cleaning agent. It's very important to notify close contacts of, uh, of somebody who's been infected so that they can look out for symptoms and consider getting vaccinated to protect themselves. Then, all patients with monkeypox benefit from management of the symptoms and the majority of people, this is really important to know, the majority of people will get better on their own with just symptom management. Some, however, but not all patients will be considered for treatment with an antiviral medication. And the people, the people who are most at risk and most um, indicated to have actual antiviral medication treatment are those who either have severe disease or involvement of sensitive anatomic areas or are at risk of severe disease. And this category includes people with immunocompromised due to uncontrolled HIV, cancer, history of transplant, certain medications and other diseases affecting the immune system, as well as young children, pregnant people, and people with certain skin conditions such as eczema that affect the integrity of their skin. T-pox is the most, or tecoviramat is the most commonly used antiviral, and it can be taken as a pill. It's currently an investigational drug. And I did wanna just point out that there is currently a study um, for anyone who uh, is eligible for TPOX to consider enrolling in if they're able to, and that's the STOMP trial, which information is available uh, through the CDC and on the internet. And that is all I have right now. Um, next, I think uh, Rebecca Werbel is gonna be talking about vaccines. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for clicking the slides. Um, as mentioned, my name is Rebecca Werbel. I work in the Office of Disaster Resilience on a, a few different areas, but really um, zeroing in on supporting the vaccine distribution in public health emergencies over the past couple of years. Um, as Dr. Hodak Avalos mentioned, there is a vaccine for monkeypox, which is wonderful in the public health world. Um, the vaccine is called Genios or Geneos, depending on the pronunciation preference. It is author currently authorized for administration in both adults and children. As mentioned, it is two injections and they are given four weeks apart. It is very, very important to get the second injection because full immunity is not uh, is not offered until you have um, until two weeks after the second injection. If you are exposed and you have an if you have a known exposure, you can get vaccination. It's called a post exposure prophylaxis. And if you are in that situation, you can get the vaccine four days after exposure. And that has been shown to present to prevent disease as well. And if you go to the next slide, we'll go into a little bit more detail about who is currently eligible for vaccination. So post exposure prophylaxis. This is um, what I just mentioned. Sometimes we call it PEP. Uh, these are for individuals who have a known contact with somebody who has tested positive for orthopox or monkeypox virus within the past 14 days. So what this means is that if you have somebody, this is not a casual contact, this is not somebody that you're walking by in a grocery store or maybe we're in the same room with for a few minutes, this is somebody that you've had a close contact with. Um, the person has been tested, has tested positive, and that case has been recorded with the local health department. If you fall into that category, then one should contact their local health department and they will arrange for the vaccine to be provided for you and anyone else who falls into that category. If you go to the next slide, 
We can talk about people who may suspect they've been exposed to um, monkeypox or may be at risk of monkeypox exposure, but don't have a confirmed, are not a confirmed contact of a confirmed case. These individuals fall into the category that we call expanded vaccination. So up on the screen here, we have the folks that are eligible under this the, these categories, which include gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men, transgender, or non-binary people who in the past six months have one or one or more of these two um, two categories: a new diagnosis of one or more national reported reportable sexually transmitted diseases. They're listed there, or more than one sex partner. So that's one category that's eligible for expanded vaccination. The next category in the lighter blue box are people who have had any of the following in the past six months: sex at a commercial sex venue sex in association with a large public event in a geographic area where monkeypox transition is occurring. So that's the second uh, group of individuals. Third group of individuals are sexual partners of people with any of the above risks in the grayish, darker blue box or in the lighter blue box, or people who anticipate experiencing the above risks. So this is a relatively broad category of expanded vaccination. And the current guidance is that we at the State Department of Health are strongly encouraging that if you fall into these categories to seek out a provider, we'll go through where you can find that, um, to seek out a provider to get the uh, Genios vaccine to prevent, the, um, to prevent transmission. And uh, next slide, please. There is one other category who is currently eligible for vaccination. That's those that have an occupational exposure. Um, like Dr. Hodak Avalos had mentioned, there have been very, very few um, uh, occupational-based exposures, but there are very um, specific occupational risk groups that are listed here relating uh, largely to laboratory personnel that are working with orthopox viruses that are handling specimens or healthcare worker response teams that are designated by the appropriate public health and anti-terror authorities. I can say that that third category, there is no one in New Jersey that falls under that, um, that third category currently, but there are in the other two categories. Next slide, please. Okay, so if you fall into one of these expanded vaccination uh, categories, where can you get a vaccine? This is uh, this is where you can get the vaccine. There are appointments and there are walk-ins available. I saw in the um, in the attendees on the call that we have some of our community-based and healthcare providers that have partnered with us um, from the various uh, earliest days that we had vaccine in the state to get this vaccine out to those that are uh, most vulnerable. Right now, we have about 25 sites in 16 counties with these community partners. That includes local health departments, federally qualified health centers, hospitals, uh, a wide range of community-based organizations. And we're very, very grateful for that partnership. That number 25 goes sort of goes up and down. There are some sites that are, are have been open from day one and continue to offer vaccine on a routine basis. And there are some sites that are what we would consider more of a pop-up location. Um, we do list all of the vaccine locations at that link that's on the bottom in the bottom box there. And we're continually working to expand and improve the access through both static and pop-up sites. So bringing the vaccine in pop-up locations to areas that are identified um, as having the greatest need. Next slide, please. And this just gives you a snapshot of where in New Jersey the vaccines have been administered. So this is as of November 22nd, we've had just under 16,000 people vaccinated. So we're gonna be over 16,000 at this point. We have a 63% uh, completion rate for those that are eligible for or due for their second dose. So we would like to see that number um, go up a little higher. Again, I'll put a plug in there. If you've gotten your first uh, dose of, of Genios that please go back for your second dose at that four weeks. And then you can see in the in the graph on the right side of the my right side of the screen that um, it's a little tiny, but those are all of the counties in New Jersey that are listed there. And it is the uh, vaccinations administered per 100,000 residents um, in the county. And largely, if you think back to the, the map that Dr. Hodak Avalos shared, that this largely follows the, the distribution of the cases in New Jersey. So we have the largest number of vaccines having been administered in Hudson County, followed by Essex, Monmouth, Union, and then going down towards the bottom of the list with the fewest number of vaccines administered in Warren, Cape May, Cumberland, and Salem. And as I mentioned, that largely follows the spread of the disease in the state. Next slide, please. 
These are some brief uh, demographics about how the uh, how the vaccine has been administered um, in different cohorts. You can see on the first chart the vaccinations by sex. Um, the majority of vaccinations have been administered to males, 89 percent, followed by females at 10 percent and then 1 percent of unknown. And this is self-reported information. Vaccinations by age, you can see that the largest category is uh, 31% is in the 30 to 39 age range. And then you have, um, it's it's sort of relatively evenly split there across the other age brackets. The, the darker green is 23 to 29. And at 20%, the darker blue is 40 to 49 at 18%. And then the yellow is at the 21%. The smallest numbers are really in the, the 65 and up, as well as the 18 and under population. And then the last, um, the last pie chart on the right is the vaccines by race and ethnicity. Um, Dr. Hodak Avalos, I believe, shared a slide about the case breakdown by race and ethnicity, and you can see here what the vaccinations look like. We have white non-Hispanics with 41%, followed by um, Hispanic individuals with 21% of the vaccinations, Black non-Hispanic 12%, unknown, uh, which means that the it was not self-reported at 10%, Asian non-Hispanic at 8%, and other non-Hispanic at 7%. Next slide, please. I think that might be, yes. Um, that was my last slide. This is just, these are resources. The, all of the information that Dr. Hodak Avalos and I shared this morning are available on the, um, with through the links that you can see there. And there are some so some more infographics that were not shared that you can use for your own purposes for education, either for yourselves or within the community. And we encourage you to access that and to distribute those widely. And that's it for me. Thank you so much. Wonderful. From here, we'll turn over to Dr. Gabriel Moore uh, to wrap up our panelist discussion. Awesome. Thank you, Greta. And hello, everyone. Um, so thank you, y'all, for sharing all this information and data on the past work that we've done, uh, what we've seen in the state in terms of trends related to monkeypox, vaccination, and infection. Uh, for this part, we want to talk a little bit more about the sort of resources that were available for disseminating information about monkeypox, uh, what the state's response was, what uh, different organizations did on the ground, many of which here are on this call, and what that means for the future. So. Next slide. Uh, I think the first thing that I wanted to highlight, though, is that a lot of the data that was shown here in this presentation has been publicly available since uh, monkeypox kind of uh, hit its peak back in July here via this dashboard that we have here on the DOH website. Um, and this portal actually served as a really useful tool for in real time being able to update folks with where the cases were happening. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, where the cases were happening, as well as uh, the demographic breakdown as we received it. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and so what's useful about this is this is kind of a lesson learned that we had in COVID-19 where it was important to give real-time information to residents about where infections were happening within their communities in order to make a better um, risk assessment about, you know, should I be getting a vaccine? Should I be limiting my time going to particular venues or doing particular activities? And so having this on online in real time was one of way in which we were trying to reach out to folks and give people the due information that they need in order to make the proper public health decision for themselves. Uh, next slide. We also, with our uh, communicable disease services and health educators, produced a lot of the resources, um, as you saw on the slide um, that Rebecca just shared here. I'm just highlighting a few of the examples of literature that was produced here at uh, DOH and disseminated in different communities. Um, on the left, we have a rat card, just like these little, or palm card, and a palm card. The palm card's literally just fitting in the palm of your hand that can be handed out at community events. Uh, bars or other places that people frequented, um, and the rat card being the sort of larger uh, version of that with more information that could be hit out as a sort of flyer. Um, we also have these brochures uh, coming in two different flavors, one being able to just tell folks where vaccinations were available in the state, um, and we did our best in order to make sure that this was updated in real time as Many of you know the eligibility for receiving a vaccination, as well as the accessibility for getting a vaccination, uh, drastically changed over the course of 
uh, of this infection spread in our state. Um, and then lastly, we have this brochure of just uh, giving you basically everything that you need to know in a one-stop shop. Um, and these were disseminated through many of our community partners. Next slide. And when I say community partners, uh, I wanted to just here list a bunch of the ones that we worked with in terms of trying to make sure that people were getting the information that they needed. Um, these are a list of different uh, grant, largely partners and grantees that we work with, um, either in HIV, STD, and tuberculosis, Office of that, um, as well as the Office of Minority and Multicultural Health. Um, our two offices uh, collaborated in order to get all of the materials that we shared before to these different partners. Because from our lens, um, the people who are on the ground being able, doing the work, working with vulnerable communities and working particularly with the LGBTQ community that was mostly impacted by this disease, um, we wanted to make sure that the sources of the information we're giving out were coming from um, trusted sources within those communities. And so here's just listed a bunch of the partners that we had the great opportunity to work with um, and also collaborate with um, and trying to um, develop our different communications that would be able to reach particular communities. Um, a lot of these folks sat at the table and gave us feedback in terms of, you know, would this be received well? Was the information understandable, uh, concise? Um, you know, I think that as many of us know, there was initially a very large stigma related to the spread of this infection. So having folks from the community who were feeling that stigma speak to what would be effective and destigmatizing when put out into the world was really useful for us to be able to um, to make a more impactful communications, both for those communities and also for the public at large. We also had the great opportunity um, to work with uh, a lot of these organizations in, during the COVID-19 pandemic as well. And so having this sort of ongoing relationship where as new public health crises emerge, we continue to see each other as uh, partners in this work to make sure that we can get information out in a timely manner and get people to a health center, a vaccination center, um, should they need it. Uh, we also had a great opportunity to work with local and county health departments as well to be able to make sure the distribution of vaccinations in the state was done in an equitable way, as well as many businesses, including uh, gay bars, uh, organizations related to the ball scene in, ball scene in northern New Jersey, um, just wherever we could find a place to be that we knew the people were, that was where we wanted to go. Next slide. So with this said, I wanna, I guess this brings us to sort of the lessons learned and applied here. Um, as the commissioner said in her opening, many of these lessons were learned during COVID-19, but really it was then put into praxis again with monkeypox. Uh, the first was of course, being able to build trust with communities through ongoing partnerships. Um, as I said before, many of the organizations that we worked with, hospitals, uh, community-based organizations, uh, LGBT organizations, et cetera, um, there, are, there are groups that we've worked with either in other areas such as HIV or STD or COVID-19, which have then allowed us to uh, be able to have more frank conversations about what's going on, what are people's perceptions of our outreach materials, what are people's perceptions of the disease, and what can we do collectively to address all of those needs. Uh, we also have learned that communications developed require community input and need to be addressed to be addressed towards our most impacted communities. So being able to, for example, sit at the HIV planning group meeting and share our communications and then have them provide feedback in the form of a survey, as well as live feedback that could then directly be inputted in the next round of communications was vital for making sure that our communities were getting the information that they needed and that it was actually being taken to heart and mind. And then of course, one le another lesson learned was to go to where the people are, uh, decreasing stigma and increase accessibility. Um, you know, for, uh, in the photos that you saw on the previous slide, that was us at um, Jersey City Pride, as well as at the Garden State Equality marches throughout the state. And that's where the people are. I think you, in order to make a proper outreach program, you have to be able to be where uh, the groups that are most impacted are and be able to provide a message that is accessible and relatable. Um, that also meant opening up 
vaccination clinics when possible at those particular locations as well in order to increase accessibility as we all know um, which leads into my last point which is the integration of mitigation strategies as a part of a daily praxis um, as we've learned we've learned with covid and continue to learn with covid you know staying up to date with your vaccinations at a regular interval um, as outlined by the cdc is the most effective way of preventing uh, serious infection as well as limiting the spread of the virus and what we saw here with monkeypox was the same thing by being very quick and intentional with our vaccination testing and outreach programs we were able to get vaccines to the people that needed it um, there are still people in our state that are who would fall in the category of needing a vaccination and that we still recommend it as much as possible but our initial stab at being able to get shots in arms was really effective in being able to bring the cases down to the low numbers that we see today. But as we think about the future, um, we are moving into the colder months. This means that people are going to be indoors more, um, increased chances for close contact. Um, we already see a lot of other communicable diseases um, on the rise, uh, such as RSV and flu and COVID-19 right now, um, all due to just the nature of us being close and inside and it's cold. Uh, so it's important for us to keep to start to adopt even monkeypox vaccination as well as a part of our health praxis that even though maybe we aren't in the danger zone right now, we don't know what's going to happen in a month from now, two months from now, or even a year from now. So just being able to stay up to date on your vaccinations and doing all of the health uh, protocols that were talked about earlier is really the best thing that we can do as a state to ensure that um, in our current situation, it stays low and in future situations, make sure that we are uh, ready for it. Next slide. All right, so at this point of the dialogue, I know we have talked at you for 30 minutes. Um, we wanna take the next 15 minutes or so to be able to have a chance to have y'all dialogue. Um, if you have a question, uh, we ask that you please put it in the Q&A. Um, we will then have our lovely moderator, Greta, read out the questions, and then we will, as the panelists, will answer them in whatever uh, order that they are given to us. Uh, if you do not have questions, then we do have some primer questions that can then get uh, y'all talking, but let's start with what y'all have to ask us. I would also say if you'd like to come off of mute and speak, uh, you can go ahead and use the raise your hand function uh, so that we know and we can unmute you from there. Um, and if you are calling in on the phone, you can do star nine to raise your hand. Uh, star nine will also lower your hand, just as an FYI. Um, and uh, if you'd like to come off of mute, please go ahead and raise your hand. We would love to hear from you and not hear ourselves talk. Okay, I have my first question coming in. Rebecca, I think it'll be toward you. Um, this is, are you aware of any ability to extend eight week shelf life for refrigerated monkeypox vaccine? We have a few doses expiring this week. So just double checking. So um, I have, we have our colleague, Susan Hannigan from the Vaccine Preventable Disease Program who was on the line and uh, we'll just defer to her. I believe the answer is no, but I just wanna confirm with our experts over at VPDB that we're not aware of any shelf life extensions at this point. Yeah, I believe the answer is no as well, but um, I'm gonna double check while uh, other questions are being answered just to make sure. Great, thank you. And so then we would just, assuming the answer is no, then we would just ask, uh, I think that was Tom Tease from the from the VNA that you know you just dispose of them according to the protocols and then record the waste of course accordingly in NJIIS. Okay, does the vaccine have to be administered by an RN? No. Um, the vaccine can be administered by, it, it, it has the same rules as any as any vaccination. So I don't actually have off the top of my head who are all of the licensed healthcare practitioners that are able to administer vaccines, but it falls under the same rules as any other vaccine. Excellent. I understand that the CDC is now saying MPOX instead of monkeypox, mainly because of stigmatism and racism. 
Will New Jersey follow suit? Uh, that's a great question. I know that the dialogue around what we use in our terminology has changed over the course of this infection. Uh, right now, the sort of state guidelines is we use HMPXV, uh, which stands for human monkeypox virus, which is just, just specifically what the virus is. It is human monkeypox virus. Um, so I think that is kind of the where, the, where we're going to keep going in terms of our nomenclature. But of course, as uh, we get more, have more co conversations with different communities, um, that may change in the future. What are the chances of getting monkeypox after being exposed once? So it, um, I can try and answer that. I just want to clarify is the question um, after having monkeypox once? Um, I, I'm assuming that that's the it, question here, but it says being exposed once. Right. So I would think if you. Uh, uh, OK, so yeah, so yes, so <laughs> currently it's thought that if once you've actually had monkeypox that you have immun immunity to the disease after that. So it's not currently recommended to get the vaccine after you've had, if you've just, if you've had monkeypox. Um, in terms of the exposure, you, if you had been exposed, but you had not developed monkeypox, you would still be at, you could still be at risk from future exposures if you had not been vaccinated or had not actually had the disease. So if you ha have disease, how long does immunity, is, is immunity thought to last at this point? Um, I, I believe immunity is thought to be long lasting from, from the disease. Like I can't give you a specific uh, in amount of time, but that is, that is the current understanding. Perfect. What sort of supply of vaccine does the state have? Uh, so currently the state has sufficient supply of vaccine um, and we have additional vaccine that is available to order from the federal government uh, at, at the initial um, onset of the onset of the outbreak in the late spring, I guess, early summer, there was not sufficient, far from sufficient supply of vaccine. But, you know, as the cases have gone down and we've able to, we were able to um, fill some of that demand. Um, and more vaccine did become available through the federal government. We now have sufficient supply um, just for everybody's information for the existing sites, they order from us on a biweekly basis. Um, and for any new sites, we're usually able to get vaccine out to them within a few days, definitely less than a week. So, and no issues with vaccine supply. Um, whether there's issues with where you can access vaccine, that's something that we would love to hear from you if, if there are additional locations where we can be sure that we have providers that can administer the vaccine. Great, so I would say to any of our participants in the chat, if there's some place that you, you know, think we should be to give vaccine, uh, some place that you're not finding it, go ahead and put that in the question and answer. We will grab that and make sure that we can work toward that. So if you wish to share a location of future vaccine for monkeypox, please go ahead and put that into the question and answer so that we can get that. Perfect. All of the slides, that was the last couple of questions we had, was um, about the uh, being able to share a copy of our slides. Um, I do believe that we will be able to share a copy of the slides. Um, and so we will most likely be able to send that out to those that are registered for this event. Um, and so we will make sure that that happens as well. Um, for a question for our panelists. Um, are there any funds for organizations to support monkeypox work? I think this might be a joint of response. I can go first. Um, there are a few different avenues that are available. Um, one of the, I will say one of the challenges with monkeypox is that there have there has been no dedicated funding from the federal government with monkeypox. So unlike COVID where there was a huge influx and we'll have to just apologize, we're making COVID analogies all over the place because that's been our world for the past couple of years. On the bright side of it, we've been able to use a lot of our COVID lessons learned here. Um, so with COVID, we had dedicated funding 
um, from the federal government and a lot of it to support this. For With monkeypox, we have not had that. So, and concurrently, there has not been a dedicated state funding source for that. That being said, we have, um, I think that programs have within the Department of Health where there is flexibility with gr existing grantees have, have um, used that flexibility um, to support uh, whether it be education or clinical staff or supplies. Um, we do have some supplies available at the state level of vaccine administration supplies that are available for distribution. Um, so that's not direct financial support, but that is sort of, you know, the supply and ancillary support that we can provide. And then most recently, I don't, we don't um, have um, someone from the Office of Local Public Health on the line, but I do believe that there was recently, um, recently some funds that were made available um, to local health departments. Gabe, I don't know if you yeah, no, we, I think uh, if you check out the DOH sort of like grants site, I think there was an opportunity that came up really recently. So, so that's specifically for the for for local health departments. Um, and then there was um, the CDC Foundation did make available. I believe the deadline has closed right for that CDC Foundation grant that was specifically for community based organizations for monkeypox. So. It's a little bit all over the place with the support that's available. So that was the long answer to there is some but not a ton of um, support for monkeypox. And again, I guess going back to Greta's point, if there are specific areas where you need the support in order to do something in any of the pieces of monkeypox, we would welcome that information so that we can see if we can match you with a funding source or if there are other resources that we can do to make sure that we're getting the, the message and all of the, uh, the vaccine, the T-pox, everything out there to those that need it most. Excellent. Um, another question, are there any changes to the monkey or MPOX administrations besides intradermal? Okay, um, Susan, you can help me out with this one too. Um, so this is sort of what has, just to sort of a little bit of background in case any everybody's not aware, initially when Geneos was um, given to the states by the federal government for monkeypox uh, prevention, it was administered subcutaneously. Um, a couple, a month or so into the process, the FDA authorized um, that it to be administered intradermally um, in the, I believe it's called the volar aspect, basically the forearm. Um, so that was, and it was very strict that it must be given intradermally if you're 18 or older. And the one of, there are two reasons for that. One was that with, the biggest benefit to that is that is a smaller dose when it's given intradermally. So that, uh, and by five times. So that, that, that quintupled our vaccine amount just by switching the route of administration. As a non-clinical person myself, when I heard, first heard this, I was like, oh, that's some great vaccine magic um, that you can just, you know, it, it becomes by five. But then once I understood and talked to all of our clinical experts at the state health department and obviously from the CDC and the federal government, you know, that they they do know what they do know what they're doing. And um, the the because of the route of administration, it requires a smaller dose when you don't need as large of a dose when it's being administered intradermally. Um, and that has played out in the preliminary studies that the federal government has done with the intradermal versus subcutaneous administration. Uh, so that switch was made, and because there were there were um, very uh, tight supply constraints at that time, it was very restricted, and there was a very small group of individuals that were eligible, 18 and over, that would have been eligible to get the sub subcutaneous. Uh, so it was intradermal. There were some challenges around that, um, both in, um, uh, Dr. Moore mentioned the stigma that's been associated. It was a visible, um, a visible raised, uh, it's called a wheel that people could see. So there was some stigma around that. It's not also not the typical way people get a vaccine. So it's it's weird. It feels a little weird um, that there are some sort of side effects on the skin that are not people aren't used to. So some people weren't crazy about it. We'll just we'll put it that way. And we do think that 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 may have played into some hesitancy um, across the board for first and second doses. So as supply constraints have lightened um, 
CDC has similarly sort of loosened a little bit their, their guidelines. And <clears throat> Susan, I don't know if you have the specific re uh, reference for the clinical considerations for the, for the Genios vaccine, but they have recently said that um, the, the way that the EUA is written is that the vaccine for 18 and older is to be administered in the intradermally. Um, if somebody does not want it in the, the forearm, there are two alternate options on the back that would not be visible, that would be covered under clothing. Um, and that if somebody still does not want that administered intradermally in those alternate locations, then they can be offered the subcutaneous administration at this point in time. So once again, a long answer to a short question is that the, the order of sort of administration is that if you're 18 and older and you're not contraindicated, it should be offered intradermally. But if the individual is not able to get it for other reasons or does, is, does will not get it for other reasons, then they can get a subcutaneous injection for, for first or second dose. And you can mix and match subcutaneous and intradermal for fifth, first and second doses. Yeah, I think you covered all that, Rebecca. And um, Jill actually had already put the interim clinical considerations in the chat. So that link is there for anyone that wants to look at it. Thanks. So if everybody is able to see the answers to the questions, you should see uh, I answered Jill Dinitz Sklar's question with her link um, and did put in the current interim clinical considerations. Um, so uh, please refer to that if you don't already have that as well. Very quickly to go back to uh, the question before about the funding. Uh, I actually had a colleague just text me uh, from the, the group. Uh, apparently the CDC Foundation um, has extended their deadline to November 30th. Um, that is a small uh, $25,000 grant opportunity, mostly meant for community-based organizations. Um, to provide vaccinations and whatnot. So I would check out, I would recommend checking out the CDC Foundation website for that opportunity. All right, I have another question here and apologies, I'm about to sneeze, so I'll try to get through it. Wouldn't going back to sub Q mess up your inventory? Um, no, but <laughs> there is a reason why, and I don't know, Susan, if you have this, this, this is a really an NJIAS question for those of you who may not be aware that um, all of the Genios administrations are captured in New Jersey's um, immunization information system, um, which is a New Jersey's uh, immunization registry. So I don't know, Susan, if you have other information about it to offer about why it wouldn't affect your inventory. Um, otherwise, we can, we can get the contact information and connect connect them with the NJIS team directly. Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, Jill would probably, as the NJIS expert, would probably explain it better than I could. But like from my understanding, the because you increase your inventory for um, when you actually start administering, but your initial inventory comes in by vial. So um, people shouldn't be increasing that inventory until, they act, until they're administering the um, the intradermal doses and then you add the doses and then it would subtract. So um, yeah, the short answer is is no, but um, if we need a more detailed explanation, I'm sure we can get that. We, we couldn't, we can bring Jill off of mute. Um, I know she's been uh, blowing up our questionnaire. So Jill, um, would you like to answer that officially? Sure, yeah. Um, I just know, like, <laughs> poor Susan. <laughs> she can be, she can only be the, the expert of so many things. Um, basically, what she said is absolutely correct. Um, when you get your doses added to your inventory initially, they are added as the number of vials you receive. When you administer them intradermally, you can increase by the number of actual intradermal doses that you gave. So I think originally when we had sent out the information about that, um, even though you could technically get five doses from one vial, um, you uh, didn't necessarily always give five doses from that vial. So you would do your clinic, you would say, okay, I used four vials today, and let's say you gave you know, 19 doses, you would add an additional 15 doses to your inventory, therefore increasing it by the number that you gave, and then it'll deduct appropriately um, when you submit your data. If you, um, that's why we don't recommend just multiplying your, your um, 
initial supply by five because that will also duplicate, it, it'll, it'll add duplicative doses as well. So um, it will not mess up your inventory. A dose is a dose, regardless of the quantity or the volume of that dose. And uh, I hope that that helps. And if there's any further questions, I can stick around. Excellent, thank you, Jill. I always bring on the experts to uh, clarify, helps me as well. So, for our panelists, can you predict if the monkeypox spread is going to get worse? Are we through the worst? Uh, what What do you see on the horizon with what we know now about uh, MPX or HMPX or monkeypox or all the various names that can be associated with this condition? Hi, I can. Um try to answer that a little bit, although I don't have any kind of magic ball that I could really, crystal ball that I could um, predict anything. I think, you know, at this point, the, there's still some uncertainty here because we don't know, there's some, a lot of things we still don't know about how effective the vaccine will be, about how the virus transmission will, may or may not change. Currently, um, most likely scenario is felt to be that the outbreak will remain concentrated in the MSM community for now. Um, cases will continue to decline as we're seeing. And why this is happening is likely due to a combination of factors that are, you know, either behavior changes among people who are at risk and recognizing their risk and ways to decrease their risk, um, the buildup of or the buildup of immunity due to either acquiring infection or getting vaccinated. So those are all, you know, factors that could be uh, could come into play. Um, so we would anticipate that there could continue to be low level transmission among the most at risk communities for a while or potentially indefinitely and whether it could change the communities that it circulates in long term i we don't know right now but um but sort of the more intermediate uh, forecast would be that we would continue to want to get the message out to the communities that we know are at risk and make sure that we can diminish the risk uh, you know as much as possible for everybody in those communities Yeah, I would agree with Dr. Avalos on that. Um, it's, it's hard to tell what's going to happen, especially with any new disease. I mean, if we think back to not bring COVID back up, you know, many people thought COVID was only going to be a month, and here we are two years later, um, and here we're looking at the, it went away after a couple months, but it could always come back. Um, so from our perspective, the big thing is just uh, knowing that we are uh, <clears throat> ensuring that our infrastructure is set up in a proper way to make sure that if it does come back, we're able to respond in a rapid manner. Um, you know, I think a lot of the partnerships that we've developed, a lot of the hospitals, um, local health departments, et cetera, that have been administering the vaccinations, it's been incredible. Uh, the different community-based organizations that we've worked with, also incredible for helping us to tailor the information, particularly in the MSM community, um, and make sure that it's effective and people understand it. Uh, I think that all of these that we uh, things that we've done over the last few months has kind of created the infrastructure to then be able to respond in a quicker manner than we may have done initially, but at the same time, um, with any new public health outbreak, there are there's a learning curve, unfortunately. Um, science takes uh, experimentation and watching trends, and a lot of times we won't know until it starts to get on our doorstep, but I'm confident that I think our response will be in a good spot. Thank you. Uh, last question that I have, uh for panelists is what are other ways to protect yourself from monkeypox? We've talked about getting vaccinated, we've talked about getting tested, but what other ways do you want to encourage people to think about in order to keep themselves safe from monkeypox? Uh, one thing that I always recommend is that uh, I like, I kind of, even though monkeypox itself is not a sexually transmitted disease, I think of it in the same way out as a sexually transmitted disease, where it's about having that conversation with future partners or people you'll be in close contact with before. You know, if you have like a rash, being like, hi, like before we have this encounter, whatever that encounter may be, say, you know, I may have, I got this sore, I don't know what it is. And then that way the partner can then be able to make a judgment call as to you know whether or not to go on with that particular situation. So I think communication is really key, a really key um, deterrent for being able to um, protect yourself and make sure you're just having an open, honest dialogue with anyone you're coming in contact with. 
And then of course, staying home if you do notice these things and not putting other people at risk. And I would add on there to encourage, uh, you know, everyone to see your doctor, get tested regularly. You know, they're here to help. And this is always something, having a good communication with your primary care doctor, making sure you're getting routine tested for everything and, you know, bring it up. I'd like to, you know, I wonder what this is. Um, and that way, we're making sure that uh, if you are linked into a good medical home, um, you can have great medical care as well. All right, I do not see any more questions uh, coming in. I really wanna thank all of our panelists today. I'd like to uh, thank all of our attendees for coming and asking your questions. And if you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Our partnerships and our open communication with each other is how we can make sure to turn the tide on monkeypox and come back and have everything working together well. So we appreciate everyone's time today and we hope you have a great rest of the day. I think we have a last slide that has our contact information. And there we go. So as Dave is getting up our contact information. We will leave this up just for a moment so that you are able to uh, write down our various contact informations. But again, if you have any additional questions after today, we're here to help and please don't hesitate to reach out.